Good evening, and welcome to Gresham College, and welcome in particular to the people downstairs who I hope can see me and hear me. Um, this is the second of my three lectures this term on paradoxes in mathematics and computing. In March next month, I'll be talking about a recently discovered paradox about mathematical games, which was disco discovered by a quantum physicist but which has astonished the mathematical world. But this month, my lecture is about another mathematical paradox, an example called the prisoner's dilemma, which at one time presented a serious problem for the relatively new mathematical subject of game theory, and how, with the help of computers, our understanding has developed so that instead of being an embarrassment, this example is now at the core of our research into fundamental aspects of human life like cooperation, reputation, and trust. For me, this is a very personal story, not because I have personally carried out research in this area, but because it has fascinated me ever since I first came across it, and at different times in my life. And so I intend to present this story in a very personal way. I'm going to tell you how I first came across this paradox, and how my view of it has changed over the course of my life. I first came across game theory when I was 17, and I was working for the engineering company Ferranti in Edinburgh before going to university. I was in a department writing machine code for mini computers, and the department had what it rather grandly called a library, which was simply a shelf of old maths books that someone had donated. One of them was called Theory of Games and Economic Behaviour by John von Neumann and Oscar Morgenstern, published in 1944. And at the time, I had no idea of the importance of this book, nor of the eminence of its authors. But I loved playing chess and bridge, so I naturally picked this book up to read in my lunch break. But I was rather disappointed. The book doesn't help much with games like chess. To play the perfect game of chess, all one has to do is to list all the possible opening moves, and then for each one, list all the possible responses, and then all the possible responses to each of these, and so on. There are only finitely many possible games, and at any stage, one simply chooses a move which always leads to a win, if there is one, or if not, to a draw, if that's possible. There's little mathematical interest in this analysis, it's just brute force calculation. And of course, it's totally impractical in real life. But the book doesn't help with bridge either. Bridge is described as a two-player game, with each partnership being regarded as a single player, albeit one without full information about the cards held by each half of the partnership. But since the most fascinating part of bridge for me was the bidding systems that allow two halves of a partnership to communicate their information, Viewing bridge in this way seems to discard what made the game particularly interesting. The book did contain a lot about poker, which I didn't play, and it seemed to be making analogies between poker and economics. But I found it hard to follow, so I cast it aside, preferring to spend my lunch break playing a number-guessing game that somebody had programmed into our mini-computer. So I was initially rather disappointed by the book by von Neumann and Morgenstern, not realising how significant it was, nor how the mathematics it introduced to the world, game theory, would fascinate me for the next 40 years so far. But my failure to appreciate it didn't stop me, a year or so later, attending a lecture on game theory given to our undergraduate mathematics society by the eminent number theorist and bridge international and strong chess player Sir Peter Swinnerton Dyer. I found Sir Peter's lecture utterly absorbing, perhaps because I'd been primed by my attempts to read the book by von Neumann and Morgenstern. He took us through the basic ideas of game theory. I don't remember many of his specific examples, but it was something along the following lines. We're interested in games, in quotes, between two or sometimes more players where the outcome depends on choices made simultaneously 
by the players. So these are not games like chess, where the players play alternately and each has perfect information about the current position, but rather games like rock, paper, scissors, where players make simultaneous choices, knowing what the opponent's options are, but not knowing which choice they will make. And the term game includes any scenario in which players interact in this way. So negotiation, trading, and decision making, and all sorts of non-recreational situations are classified as games and are covered by this analysis. In such a game, we can draw up a table showing the relationship between the choices and the outcome. My table will have a row for each of my possible choices or actions, and a column for each of my opponent's options. The entry in the table will show the result of the corresponding, the result which corresponds to these choices by me and my opponent. So for rock, paper, scissors, um, the table would look like this. Remember, the outcomes are from my perspective, not my opponent's. And this is the game where two players have a hand behind their back and pull it out, showing either rock or paper or scissors. Paper beats rock, rock beats scissors, and scissors beats paper. So the diagram looks something like this. We see that if I choose rock and my opponent chooses paper, I lose. If you both choose rock, we draw. If I choose rock and my opponent chooses scissors, then I win. So these are the outcomes we get from my perspective, and my opponent can draw up a similar table showing the results from their point of view. I'll come back to this one in a moment, but another example might be the decisions made when a penalty kick is taken in a football match. The striker decides, in a rather simplified model, to place the ball to the left, to his left or to his right. The goalkeeper can choose to go to their left or to their right, or they can wait to see which way the striker shoots, in which case there is less chance of saving a well-struck penalty, but perhaps more chance of saving a weak one. The likelihood of scoring might be as follows, um, and here the number in each cell is the probability that the, stri the striker will score, and these numbers are made up for illustrative purposes only and are not based on any sort of research, but what they show is that if, for example, the striker shoots to the left, and the goalkeeper goes to his left, which is the wrong way, the striker has a, is almost certain to score. They might shoot wide or hit the post, but they'll probably score. But if the goalkeeper goes the right way, then the striker's chance is perhaps only about 0.4. And if the goalkeeper waits, then their chance of saving it is um, probably about a third. Okay, these numbers are totally arbitrary, but they show the kind of thing we can do. So in both these games, if either player is able to predict correctly what the other will do, then they have a big advantage. If I know my opponent always chooses paper, I will choose scissors and win. If the goalkeeper knows the player always shoots right, then by going left, he can maximize his chance of saving the penalty. If the striker knows that the goalkeeper always goes right, then by shooting right, the striker can maximize his chance of scoring. So it's intuitively obvious, therefore, that both players should weigh their tactics. But how? If my opponent always chooses rock, then scissors, and then paper, then rock again, and carries on in that sequence, then I can spot the pattern and win every time. So how should the players weigh their tactics? Any pattern at all might be worked out by the opponent. So a random strategy of some sort is necessary. And the mathematics of game theory allows one to work out how often this random strategy should choose each option. So how does this math work? Let's analyze the rock, paper, scissors example. Now, if I'm optimistic, I may think I can outguess my opponent and predict what they are going to do. But should I be optimistic? Mathematicians in this situation are naturally pessimistic. If we assume the worst, so that, if it is possible for them to do so, our opponents will always play optimally to exploit any weakness in our strategies, then what we want to do is to find the strategy which they can exploit least effectively. In other words, we want to find the strategy that, 
whatever our opponent may do, provides the best result for us. Being pessimists, we might assume we're facing a possible overall loss, and we want to minimise this maximum possible expected loss. So let's assign the reasonable values of minus one for a loss, zero for a draw, and plus one for a win. So our table for rock, paper, and scissors now looks like this table here. I want to know what, how I should play. So let's suppose I decide to play each of the three options with probabilities rho for rock, pi for paper, and sigma for scissors. And these will have to sum to one. How can my opponent play against this strategy? Well, let's suppose that of my three probabilities, that rho is the biggest, that I play rock more often than either of the others. Then what happens if my opponent plays paper on every round? We will win when we choose scissors with probability sigma, and we will lose when we choose rock with probability rho, and we will draw the remainder. So our expected result is one times sigma minus one times rho, and since we assumed that rho was the biggest of the three, then this quantity is negative. So on average, we will lose if we use this strategy and our opponent chooses paper all the time. And what this analysis shows is that if our strategy allows them to do so, our opponent can ensure a negative outcome for us by choosing to play every time the antidote to our most common choice. The only way we can achieve a non-negative expected outcome is by choosing each option with equal likelihood, in which case our expected outcome is zero, whatever our opponent does. This requires selecting each play with probability one-third, so I might choose by throwing dice, hidden from my opponent, and playing rock if it comes up one or two, paper if it's three or four, and scissors if it's five or six. So in the sense of game theory, this is our optimal strategy. We could find a similar optimal strategy for the striker and one for the goalkeeper in my football penalty example. And there is a full game theory analysis, a much better analysis than mine, which takes into account details like right-footed players do better shooting to the left and vice versa. Um, and the link for that is in my transcript. But as then the computers are much better than humans, both at choosing options at random, which we are not very good at, and at spotting patterns in their opponent's choices. If you want to try your hand at rock, paper, scissors against an experienced computer, the New York Times offers a web facility for doing so. And again, the URL is in the transcript. A rock, paper, scissors is a fairly simple game, but it can be extended. The French have a version called Pierre Papier Ciseau Puy, which adds a well into which rock and scissors fall. So well beats rock and well beats scissors, but paper covers the well and wins. This removes the symmetry, or seems to, and makes the game possibly more interesting mathematically, because rock and scissors each beat only one of the other three, whereas well and paper each beat two. However, since well obtains the same results against scissors and paper as rock does, and well beats rock, why would anyone ever choose rock? Because well is a better choice. And if neither player ever chooses rock, we're now back to the original three weapon game, this time it's well, paper, scissors. A German version adds bull, which drinks the well, eats paper, but is tabbed by scissors and crushed by rock. And of course, those of you who watch the Big Bang Theory will be familiar with another extended version of the game, Rock, Paper, Scissors, Lizard, Spock, created by Sam Cast and Karen Bryla in referencing Star Trek. Here, Spock smashes scissors and vaporizes rock, so Spock defeats scissors and rock, but he's poisoned by lizard and disproven by paper, so lizard and paper defeat Spock. And similar logic defines the outcome for lizards. This one appears to be symmetric and looks very similar to the original three weapon game, but with less likelihood of a draw, because there's only a one in five chance of a draw. However, there is a twist. 
some players have difficulty making the Spock symbol. I got it. Um, it's the Vulcan salute with the thumb separate from the four middle fingers together and the ring finger pinky together. And that physical consideration is going to affect the mathematics because if you think your opponent can't play it, it will change everything. One common feature of all the games I've mentioned so far is that what one player gains, the other player loses. If the striker scores, the goalkeeper concedes. If I choose Spock and my opponent chooses Rock, I win and they lose. We call these zero-sum games because if we add up the outcomes for the two players, we get zero. One player's winnings exactly balance out the other's loss. But not all games in game theory are like this. So Sir Peter Swinnerton Dyer finished his lecture by describing a game called The Prisoner's Dilemma. And here's the scenario as I remember it from his talk. It's set in the Wild West. Two cowboys are arrested by the sheriff who is seeking to punish someone for a bank robbery. For the purposes of the discussion, it doesn't matter whether our cowboys are guilty or not. And the sheriff doesn't care either. Or at least so the story is. But the sheriff has no evidence. So to get a conviction, he needs one of the cowboys to implicate the other. He arrests them both, puts them separately in solitary confinement, and offers each of them the following deal. If neither of you admit to the crime, then I'll pin some other offence on you, and you'll both go to jail for two years. But if you admit that you did it together, and your partner denies it, then I'll use your evidence to convict him, and he'll go to jail for 20 years, while in return for your evidence, I let you off with six months. Similarly, if he admits it and you don't, he'll get six months, and you'll get 20 years. If you both admit to the crime, then I don't need both your confessions, so it's not worth so much, so um, you'll both go to prison for 15 years. Now, both cowboys know that the other is being offered the same deal. They can't communicate with each other. What should they do? Well, we can consider this as a game, in the general sense, between the two cowboys, in which the options for each are to cooperate, and that means cooperate with each other, not with the sheriff. So cooperate means refusing to admit to the robbery, or to defect on the other by admitting to the robbery and implicating the other. And we can draw up a table showing the payoffs. So here, the entries in the table represent the time to be spent in prison. And because being in prison is a bad thing, we've made these negative, because mathematicians like maximizing things, and it's better to maximize negative numbers and minimize positive ones. So um, the entries represent the time to be served in prison in years. And um, you'll notice this is not a zero-sum game, because if both players cooperate, then the total sum is minus 4. But if both players defect, the total sum is minus 30. So suppose I'm in this position. What do I do? If I were a hardened criminal, I wouldn't betray my partner, and I could rely on them not to betray me. But what if I'm a mathematician? Well, let's apply some game theory. If you look at this table, you see that every outcome in the second row for defect is better for me than the corresponding outcome in the first row for cooperate. Minus a half is better than minus two, six months is better than two years, and 15 years is better than 20 years. In other words, um, whatever my partner does, I will do better if I defect than if I co cooperate. In the jargon, we say that the defect row dominates the cooperation row. I don't know what my partner is going to do, but whatever they do, I will get a shorter sentence if I defect. So logically, it's a no-brainer. Our mathematical cowboy will defect and therefore ensure a better result than if they cooperated. And so, applying the same logic, will their mathematical partner. And this is slightly unfortunate because it means our two mathematicians following impeccable mathematical logic both defect and get 15 years in prison each. While in the next town, two cowboys in the same position 
who had the good fortune not to be chained in mathematics, both cooperate and get out after two years. So this isn't a good example, a good advert for the value of mathematics, because in this instance, mathematics has got the two of us an extra 13 years in jail. But what's wrong with logic? Well, Swinnerton so and I finished his lecture all these years ago, and perhaps my memory is not totally reliable, but my recollection is that he said that this paradox was the end of game theory. As a branch of mathematics, it couldn't survive this disastrous example. Applying mathematics should lead to the best outcome, not the worst. For non-zero sum games, the mathematics failed, and so mathematicians abandoned this previously promising subject. It was a very anticlimactic ending to an otherwise inspiring lecture. And then I wonder if, in fact, Sir Peter was quite as negative as my memory records. But the prisoner's dilemma fascinated me. Following this lecture, I started seeing prisoner's dilemmas everywhere. At that time of high inflation and industrial unrest, some politicians were accusing trade unionists of irrationality in making high pay demands that would, it was suggested, fuel inflation and leave them worse off than if it moderated their pay claim. But it seemed to me that even if that connection, which I think is highly dubious, were, were true, um, the unions were in a prisoner's dilemma situation. Um, defecting by seeking a big pay rise was a mathematically correct behaviour. It didn't matter what the other unions did, your members would do best if you claimed a big rise, and so on. <coughs> Another example was a scare over vaccination against whooping cough. Some people believed there was a small risk of adverse reaction to whooping cough vaccine. If everyone else has been vaccinated, then there'll be nobody I can catch the disease from, and I can avoid the risk of side effects by not being vaccinated. But if a lot of people think that way, then rates of vaccination will fall, and we'll all be at greater risk. And indeed, there were two whooping cough epidemics in the 1970s following a decline in vaccination, showing how the prisoner's dilemma could have serious consequences in real life. These examples are rather oversimplified, but the depressing point is that the mathematics appears to show that even if everyone makes a sensible choice, we can't always achieve the outcome that is the best possible for everybody. I later discovered that these are variations of a scenario called the tragedy of the commons. Herders were allowed to graze their cows and sheep on common land. By grazing one more animal, a herder derived benefit while the cost is shared by everybody else. So logically, each herder was incentivized to graze as many animals as possible. There was nothing to be gained by an individual herder by not grazing every animal they could, and there was something to be lost. So the inevitable tragic consequence was that the land was overgrazed and the common resource was lost. And this too is a form of prisoner's dilemma. So what does the prisoner's dilemma tell us? Well, perhaps the math doesn't work, but it might appear also that, left to themselves, people will not do what is necessary for the common good because it is logical to be selfish. And if, if that is the case, possible benefits will be lost. Perhaps we need a nanny state to dictate what we must do in order to ensure the best outcomes for everyone. But it's not a very attractive prospect. There are many other examples of the prisoner's dilemma, and I'm going to present two of rather different degrees of seriousness. First, the nuclear arms race and the Cold War. We have two superpowers. Each superpower can choose to devote enormous resources to developing vast arsenals of nuclear weapons, or to devote the money, research, and labor to hospitals and schools and other good things. We can draw up a table, um, and so basically, if both superpowers spend the money on nuclear weapons, we end up in the bottom right-hand column with a military stalemate and not very many hospitals and schools. If, not, if both sides spend the money on social benefits, then we still have a military stalemate, but we're all much better off. If one side 
expands its nuclear arsenal and the other side doesn't, then that, the first side has a big military advantage. And since being military weaker than the other superpower would be disastrous, and being stronger would be particularly useful, we see again that the entries in the bottom row of the table dominate the row above. It's better to have a military advantage than stalemate. It's better to have stalemate than this disadvantage. So, so the rational choice for the superpower leader has to be to build more nuclear weapons. Of course, the leader of the other superpower, being equally rational, makes the same choice. And the inevitable result is that we end up down here, in this, in this column, rather than up here. Um, we live, live in a world in which resources will always go into the swords rather than plowshares. The second example is um, a bit less serious. Um, it, it comes from the world of opera, and specifically Puccini's Tosca. In the crucial scene of this opera, the, the heroine, the prima donna Tosca, is negotiating with the evil chief, police chief, Scarpia, for the life of her lover, the rebel Mario, who has been sentenced to death. They make an agreement. Tosca will sleep with Scarpia if he arranges that the firing squad will use fake bullets so that Mario can play dead and then make his escape. Tosca is prepared to make this sacrifice to save the life of her lover. However, each party has the opportunity to defect on this agreement. Scarpia can write an order which does not specify fake bullets. While Tosca, after Scarpia has sent off his order, can stab him to death with a convenient knife. So here's the payoff table for this game from Tosca's viewpoint. And basically, um, Tosca's main hope is that Mario will live, which means that she prefers to be in the column where Scarpia uses fake bullets, and um, failing that, she would rather kill Scarpia than have sex with him. So the outcomes can be ranked. The best one is the top left. The worst one is in the top right. And we see that we have a classic prisoner's dilemma in which everything, in which the bottom row dominates the top one. Scarpia's choices look like this. And um, basically, he prefers to live than to die. And he's less concerned about it, but he would rather Mario were dead than alive. So we can rank the four things here, and we see the, the layout of the table is exactly the same. We've got OK up here, worst, best, and pretty bad. And for both of them, the bottom row dominates the top row, which means that logically, each of them needs to defect. So mathematically, neither player in this game has any rational option but to defect. <laughs> Well, what happens in the opera? Well, sadly, both characters are good mathematicians, and they do both defect. Tosca kills Carpia, and then finds, in the moving finale, that the chief of police has reneged in the deal, and the firing squad used real bullets. Furthermore, this isn't a one-off choice. Every time I listen to my CD, the same thing happens. <laughs> yeah. but, but it could all have ended happily, if only they'd both cooperated. Mind you, it wouldn't have been a very interesting opera. Now, the first of these examples may offer genuine insights into the economics of the Cold War arms race. But does game theory really help us understand the opera? Well, the essence of the prisoner's dilemma is that both parties know that the other is in the same position, and both parties are aware of the options available to the other. But in Tosca, that isn't actually the case. The heroine's happiness, as she watches her lover being shot, with what she wrongly thinks are fake bullets, doesn't suggest that she has even thought of the possibility that Scarpia might go back on his word. And if Scarpia had thought that Tosca might stab him, he quite possibly wouldn't have left the knife on the desk for her to use. So this example, which is due to the eminent mathematical psychologist Anatol Rapoport, of whom we will hear more shortly, isn't to be taken too seriously, and I'm sure Rapoport didn't intend that it should. Incidentally, Rappaport, rather ironically for one of the world's top game theorists, 
was apparently very good at chess, but not at all good at poker. Game theory may initially have been treated with suspicion by mathematicians because of the paradox of the prisoner's dilemma, but it was taken up by economists, and indeed 12 game theorists have won the Nobel Prize for economics. It has been used by the mathematician Stephen J. Brams to analyze the behavior of politicians, first of all, characters in literature, and even the relationship between God and his creations. And recently, Michael suk Young Chui has argued, not perhaps entirely convincingly for me, that Jane Austen's novels are a systematic exploration of game theory, 150 years before von Neumann and Morgenstern wrote their book. And between 2007 and 2009, a version of The Prisoner's Dilemma featured on the TV game show Golden Balls, hosted by Jasper Carrot. Two contestants had to choose whether to split or steal their jackpot. If they both split, each got half. If one chose to steal and the other split, the stealer took home everything. And if both chose to steal, they both took home nothing. So we ignore the table like this. Um, and that shows what each player gains. And again, we see that the steal choice dominates the split. Whatever the other player does, the outcome is better, or at least no worse, if we choose to steal. But the same logic applies to the other player. So if we both choose, ra choose rationally, we both go home with nothing, when we could have had half a jackpot each. There are some interesting clips of this on YouTube, and I've given links in my transcript. Um, it's interesting to see how people behave in a prisoner's dilemma situation in real life, or at least in a TV game show. But game theory was taken up in other areas, and one particularly interesting application um, was in biology, where um, evolutionary biologists like John Maynard Smith uh, used the theory to understand animal behavior. So here's an example. Um, suppose we have two birds competing for food. They can fight for a piece of food. We need numbers in it, so we'll assume that the food is worth 50 units in some scale of avian benefit. Or they can use some other method, such as competitive display. Um, this would cost each bird, say, 10 units each. Um, and following that, the loser will leave the food to the winner. If there's a fight, then the losing bird gets injured. And that injury is, we're assuming, is worth 100 points, which is... Um, well, a, a rather bigger loss than the food is worth. We consider two possibilities. Hawks will be prepared to fight for any piece of food. Doves will always yield to a hawk, while two doves will display, with the winner getting the food. The terms hawk and dove here refer to the behaviour rather than to the species. So here's the table of expected payoffs. Um, so basically, if a hawk meets a dove, the hawk will gain 50 points by eating food from the food. So I'm a pointer. Okay, and that's in the top right hand column. Um, whereas a dove will get zero because it doesn't get hurt but doesn't get any food. If two hawks meet, well, one of them will get the food worth 50 points and the other will get injured worth minus 100 points. So the expected value is a half of 50 minus a half of 100, which is minus 25. And if two doves meet, they'll both pay 10 points to display, and one will get 50 and the other will get nothing. So that comes out, on average, as a half of 50 minus a half of 0 plus, 50, plus minus 10, which is 15. Now notice, first of all, no, neither row dominates the other here. So this isn't a simple game in which there's an obvious rational choice. Um, in fact, if all the birds behave like doves, they will do very well, because they never get hurt, and they generally profit from the food. But they're vulnerable. If a colony consists entirely of doves, and then a couple of hawks join in, the hawks will get more than their fair share of food, with very little risk of injury, because almost all their competitors will be with doves. So a colony which is all doves is potentially unstable. 
And what might then interest us is what kind of colony would be stable, what mixture of birds would be stable in evolutionary terms. And we find that there's an evolutionary stable st strategy, which in this case arises when about 58% of the birds are hawks, or alternatively, each bird behaves randomly as a hawk or a dove, with a probability of about 58% that it's hawkish in any one interaction. If this is the situation, then no incomers with a different strategy can exploit the colony. And game theory has provided a significant insight into the biological situation. So game theory was useful in biology. <coughs> but for me, the prisoner's dilemma remained frustrating. And then, in May 1983, I read Douglas Hofstadter's Mathematical Themas column in Scientific American about the work of the political scientist Robert Axelrod. And suddenly, a whole rich new understanding of the prisoner's dilemma opened up. What Axelrod had done was to explore repeated prisoner's dilemmas. He used the power of computer to see what happened over a series of games. So he set up a tournament in which he invited people to submit computer programs with strategies to be applied during a long series of games against the same opponent. These strategies could be based on the opponent's previous choices and on random numbers or whatever. And the winning strategy was um, submitted by Anatol Rappaport, whose name I mentioned earlier, and it was called Tit for Tat. It's a very simple strategy. Tit for Tat cooperates on the first round and thereafter does whatever its opponent did on the previous round. So it's about as simple a strategy as you could imagine, really. It was certainly the shortest of all the computer programs submitted. Axelrod told people about the result of this tournament and then arranged another tournament. And even though people knew that Tit for Tat had won the first tournament and tried to devise strategies to defeat it, Tit for Tat won again. Furthermore, Axelrod carried out computer tournaments which modelled natural selection. So successful programs generated more copies of themselves in the next round, whereas unsuccessful programs died out. Tit for Tat was phenomenally successful in this scenario too, driving out all its competitors. And this is the more remarkable, because in any series of games against the same opponent, Tit for Tat can never outscore its opponent. But it's very good at stimulating mutually rewarding behavior in its opponents. While other strategies may succeed in exploiting some opponents, when they come up against another, against each other, they tend to end up with low-scoring series of mutual defections, while tit for tat is picking up points through mutual cooperation. So Axelrod, who was collaborating with the evolutionary psychologist, evolutionary biologist W. D. Hamilton, identified four traits which contributed to tit for tat success. First of all, tit for tat is a nice strategy. It's never the first to defect in a series of games against the same opponent. It is forgiving. It doesn't maintain a grudge. If you defect against it, it retaliates on the next round. But after that, if you go back to cooperating, your defection is forgotten. Tit for tat is retaliatory. So if you defect, it will immediately defect back. It doesn't ignore defections. And it is clear. It's easy for the opponent to work out what it is doing. Well, Axelrod presented his tournaments as a solution to a major problem of the time in evolutionary theory. Humans and other animals are often remarkably unselfish. We do favors for people we don't know and who aren't related to us. We pass over opportunities to take advantage of each other. We seem to have evolved to be reasonably altruistic. But evolutionary theory appears to suggest that selfish traits should be favored by evolution, at least selfishness towards people who are not related to you. And altruism towards strangers appears to have no evolutionary benefit. So how does altruism arise? Axelrod's Prisoner's Dilemma tournaments presented a model in which altruistic behavior, that is tit for tat, 
could take advantage of the non-zero sum rewards to be more successful in evolutionary terms than more selfish alternative strategies. And Axelrod presented examples showing the tit-for-tat strategy apparently in action, both in the natural world and in human war and sport. This scientific American article seemed to me to be rather wonderful. This one-time mathematical paradox was now a significant factor in the solution of a major scientific problem. And unlike the tragedy of the commons and similar analyses, it was showing the value of nice, cooperative behaviour. Maths was showing that it pays off to be unselfish. I remember after reading that article, walking through London, feeling that something I'd been puzzling over for many years now suddenly made sense. So this fascinating example in game theory, rather than showing that mathematics prevents individuals from arriving at the mutually best outcome and dictating that the tragedy of the commons is a recurrent motif of the human condition, now shows us that altruism works and that cooperation can evolve naturally rather than having to be dictated by oppressive state control, which is a very nice outcome except that it turns out to be rather more complicated than that, as I realised when I read the very impressive popular books of Matt Ridley, The Red Queen, and especially The Origins of Virtue, which came out in 1996. (coughs) I find Ridley to be a remarkable science writer. He's extremely well informed about an enormous range of current research, and he presents fascinating and thought-provoking ideas very lucidly. Although I often disagree with his political views, I find his science writing, his science, very convincing, and he's introduced me to whole fields of fascinating work. It was only recently that I discovered, rather to my surprise, that writing wasn't his only career. Uh, He was chairman of the bank Northern Rock, when in 2007, it became the first bank in 150 years to suffer a run, with customers queuing to withdraw their deposits. But happily, he is now back writing popular science books, most recently, The Rational Optimist. And Ridley strongly challenges the version of the tragedy of the commons that I gave above. He argues that, contrary to the pessimistic conclusion I drew above, our arrangements at common grazing work extremely well. The community manages the land, and fear of acquiring a reputation for selfishness or simple unwritten rules generally prevented overgrazing very successfully. Only when society and communities changed and more outsiders came in and reputation didn't matter so much did overgrazing occur. Legislation isn't always needed to maintain the common good in a tragedy of the common scenario. Read these books present research which investigates various ramifications of the use of prisoner's dilemma in modelling cooperation. For example, what happens when one has imperfect information about one's opponent's choices, or if a player makes a mistake? If I'm playing the prisoner's dilemma game repeatedly against the same opponent, and we're both playing tit for tat, then we will both prosper. But what happens if I mistakenly think my opponent defected on the last turn? Then I will defect, and then they will defect in turn because I defected, and I will retaliate against this new defection, and we will end up in an endless cycle of each alternatively exploiting and being exploited by the other, resulting in us both being much worse off than if we'd cooperated throughout. Similarly, if one of us decides to experiment by defecting on one turn, or if one accidentally makes the wrong choice, then we both lose out for the rest of time. So where information is imperfect, or where players make mistakes, tit-for-tat is no longer such a successful strategy. And unfortunately, it's not always the case that everyone being nice to each other leads to the best outcome for all, or that one can never gain by treating people badly. In game theory, as in life, there are situations in which cooperating with some people and defecting against others can lead to better outcomes for the exploiter. This mathematics can possibly help us to understand human behaviour, but it doesn't tell us what we should or should not do. 
The mathematics of cooperation and related matters like trust and reputation has become a major area of research. We are much more ready to do a favour for X, who has a reputation for altruism and donates generously to charity, than for Y, who we know to have treated people badly in the past. And these issues are now a major part of research into cooperation. The prisoner's dilemma and computer tournaments and simulation are an important tool in this work, which provides insights into politics, negotiation, and how to obtain mutual benefits while minimizing the opportunities for freeloaders. For example, why do we get angry? Anger over trivial matters appears to be a gross overreaction. If someone pushes in front of me in the post office queue, the cost to me is small. My getting angry and punching them risks my getting prosecuted or punched back, both of which are much more costly to me than having to wait an extra minute before buying my stamp. But the possibility of my losing my temper serves as a deterrent. People don't push into queues for fear of being punched, however illogical it would be for me to do so, because they know that I may not be able to control my temper. If we behave in what appears to be a strictly rational way, people may take advantage of us. Perhaps some games players and sportsmen deliberately cultivate a reputation for losing their temper, because if, if an opponent thinks you're irrational, their decisions must allow for your potential illogical choices, and that makes the game harder for them. Another possibly useful example, lesson from game theory, is that cooperation can be fostered by breaking a big, high-risk game down into a series of lower-risk ones. When I meet someone who might become a friend, rather than exchanging important secrets when we first meet, it's better that the relationship develops gradually, so that at each small step, we have much less to lose if the other turns out to be untrustworthy. So that's an example of game theory helping us in everyday life. Although you may perhaps wonder, as I sometimes do, whether we need game theory to tell us this. Thinking about game theory over the years, there have been times when I've wondered whether the insights we gain are not, usually, rather banal, simply putting in mathematical language what we already know about obvious human behaviour. Furthermore, there have been times when I've wondered whether it's appropriate to apply game theory to human behaviour and relationships, or whether the theory trivialises what is important about being human. Does casting Jane Austen's novels as lessons in game theory do full justice to these literary classics? But my doubts have been allayed recently by a book by Martin Novak, um, one of the leading researchers in this area, um, and his recent book on the science of cooperation. Novak shows how the prisoner's dilemma is still at the heart of computer modeling and simulation, which are helping us better understand the factors underlying cooperation, like how we establish trust and the role played in that by reputation. One interesting result is that it turns out that while in the traditional applied mathematics of engineering and physics, systems usually end up in a steady state in which everything is in equilibrium, that is not true in social systems. In computer models of communities that start off being highly altruistic, then there are opportunities for more selfish individuals to prosper, and the society over time becomes more selfish. But then altruism builds up again, and the community swings backwards and forwards, having periods of relative altruism and periods of comparative selfishness. The modeling suggests that these cycles, rather than a steady state, might be the natural state of society. Novak argues in his book that the insights we gain from this research may provide our best hope for avoiding global disaster through climate change. Could they? We have a potential analogy of the tragedy of the commons. No single nation can act on their own to prevent climate change, and any individual nation can get an economic advantage by doing less than the others. A politician who commits their country to make more than their fair share of sacrifices may be a visionary potential saviour of the world, but this isn't a platform which is likely to get them elected to a position where they could actually put these plans into practice. So the game theory of cooperation has the potential to help nations around the world 
collaborate on major challenges like climate change and may therefore hold the key to the future of the world. So in this lecture, I've tried to share my personal journey regarding the prisoner's dilemma. I first met it as an alarming paradox which seemed to put into question an otherwise exciting branch of mathematics. But then, Axelrod's work showed that the prisoner's dilemma was not just an annoying paradox, but rather was at the heart of the explanation of the evolution of altruism. It solved a significant, significant, it solved a significant puzzle in evolutionary theory. It offers insights into the thoughts of opera and fiction, but is at the heart of research which improves our understanding of human behaviour. By helping us understand how to promote cooperation between nations, it may even have a profound effect on the future of our planet. My lifetime fascination with the prisoner's dilemma is perfectly summarised by the words of Martin Novak. There's still so much more left to find out. We've only explored a small subset of this extraordinary game. Our analysis of how to solve the dilemma will never be completed. This dilemma has no end. But this lecture does have an end. Thank you for listening, and I'll be very happy to take questions. <laughs>